Welcome to Rain Gardens 101. If you're thinking about building a rain garden, you are in the right place. I'm Susan Bryan with Washtenaw County Water Resources, and I'm here with Lisa Dennis, also of Washtenaw County Water Resources. I teach the Master Rain Gardener class here in Washtenaw County, along with some other people. Um, and uh, we'll have, uh, if so if you're interested in taking the Master Rain Gardener class, that is a great way to learn how to build a rain garden and design it yourself, which is fun and creative. Uh, we'll have, we'll talk way more about that later. And uh, Lisa Dennis and I both do another service that you get free as a Washtenaw County resident is we will give you personal advice on planning your rain garden. So if you're wondering, where should I put this rain garden? Is it really going to solve my water problem? You know, if you're a little worried about it, we will give you one-on-one -on -one ad advice looking at your actual property. Um, and we'll talk more about that service later, but we do uh, assistance visits used to be in person. Now we do it on the phone, you know, and look at pictures and things like that, but we know what we're doing and we can give you some expert advice. Okay, so that's us. Let me get a couple of housekeeping announcements out of the way. One is that Lisa and I are gonna put in the resources that we talk about, we're gonna put them into the chat and uh, feel free to click on them there. Also, there will be a follow-up email that shows that will have those links in there. So don't feel like you have to like write them down or remember them. Um, but if someone else puts a link in the chat, maybe in these modern times, don't click on it. <laughs> we never know, you know, who might be in here, although generally we're friendly. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh, and also if you have questions, like particular questions about rain gardens that you'd like us to answer during the presentation, please do ask those questions. Um, put them in the Q&A. It's a little bit easier for us to keep track rather than in the chat, which kind of scrolls by quickly. Um, and Lisa will be answering those questions as I talk and I'll be doing the same thing for her. But if there's something big, we'll actually bring it up at the end and have, you know, if you have questions that we should address to everyone, we will do that. So if you have big rain garden questions, uh, feel free to, you know, chat, chat, them, chat them up in the question and answer and we will answer them. All right, well, without further ado, Let's go on to um, our agenda for today. Okay, so generally, this before is before you go with that. Um, I just oh, want yeah, to go note where since we're following along in the questions, I'm going to be looking off to the side. So you know, don't think that I'm ignoring you. It's it's because I have a second screen that I'm going to be looking at your questions. <laughs> I'm trying to answer your questions while we go, and add the links. And we're we're paying attention. So yeah. we're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I don't have a solitaire cane going on over here, <laughs> if they even have that anymore. <laughs> All right, so our agenda for today is, um, we assume this is Rain Gardens 101. We don't assume you know anything about a rain garden. So what is it for? People often ask me, like, oh, doesn't, you know, rain fall on all gardens? Um, so we get back into the big picture of what is a rain garden for? What is the big problem that it's trying to solve? Why plant a rain garden? What are some of the issues you might be able to address in your uh, landscape with a rain garden? Um, what are some reasons why you might want to do it? You know, it's fun for one. <laughs> Let's give you a little preview. Uh, what big environmental problems do these little rain gardens address? And then we really want to zero in on some of the resources for how you can learn uh, how to build a rain garden, because it's not really something you pick up in you know, our 40 minute presentation here. Uh, so where can you go to get a more in-depth uh, instruction? And for fun, how do I attract butterflies to my garden this summer? Of course, butterflies like all different kinds of gardens, but they especially like rain gardens. So how can I um, enjoy butterflies in my garden this summer? And then also some fun ways to volunteer in Washtenaw County. Um, we're still uh, using and uh, working with volunteers this year and uh, in safe ways. So something to look forward to. And then at the end, we'll go through your questions and feel free to bring it. Okay, so what is a rain garden? It's not just a garden, or although it is just as beautiful as a, just any old rain garden, any old garden, this is a rain garden at EMU Family Housing. And it solved a problem on their property that the mowers, you know, it's a mowing company, they kept getting stuck in the lawn there and they were just annoyed. And um, so the rain garden captures that water in the garden where the plants can soak it up and they love it, they thrive, but
but then the grass stays a little drier. And so the mower is much happier. So that's solving their site problem, but it's also addressing a big environmental problem, uh, which is stormwater pollution. And that's the pollution that gets washed into our rivers and lakes and creeks and streams and all the way to the Great Lakes. So the EPA um, uh, looks at rain garden as one of the best ways to address that pollution. So a rain garden, if you look at this uh, slide of the house, instead of in the old ways of having the water go down the driveway into the gutter and into the grate in the street, it takes that water, which as gardeners we know is super valuable, rainwater, and it puts it into the garden. So you can see instead of going you know, in, right into the drain and going away like it were waste, the water is going right into the rain garden and the rain garden soaks that water up and loves it and thrives. So you can see this um, drawing really um, does a good job of showing how you have to sculpt the ground a little bit to get the water to go into the rain garden. Oops. So in the rain garden, the plants are really what's keeping this uh, machine working and the roots soak up that water and they evapotranspire it into the air and they also make little tunnels so that the water will soak into the ground and replenish the groundwater. So it's do they're doing an amazing environmental service and they're the engines behind this whole system. There's nothing new under the sun. Nature did it first, so we're really just copying nature what used to happen all over the place and uh, um, calling it a new thing that it's a rain garden, but it's really ancient, ancient stuff. All right, so it's simple. All you need is your downspout from your roof to go to the garden. And here you can see a couple in Ann Arbor who um, the pipe, you can see going to their garden and then the plants inside the garden are thriving. Here's another picture of a different rain garden. On the left, the water comes down the downspout over the grass into the garden. You can see the garden is kind of cupped so that it catches that water and lets it puddle. They're not very deep, only like three to four inches deep, and it catches it before it goes onto the driveway. And that's what you want your rain garden to do. Okay, why would you want to build a rain garden? Well, it's fun. You can see Lori is here, happy that her rain garden is thriving. I think she's a little happier because her two teenage sons dug it for her, which is the best way to build a rain garden is to Tom Sawyer or someone else to dig it for you. Um, especially if you have teenagers, that's the best way to do it. Um, so it's fun, you know, like we're talking about uh, pollinators and butterflies and um, uh, birds coming to your garden. That is so fun and just a Zen uh, way to contemplate life and the universe. Um, and it's fun to get your hands dirty in the, in the soil. Oops, let me go back one. Um, so here are some of the things that, uh, some of the creatures that I have seen in my rain garden, like butterflies and goldfinches. Like we're not talking just sparrows here, we're talking goldfinches. Like look at that beautiful bird. Um, and butterflies, these are, um, I know when I sit on my porch with a glass of lemonade and I see these wonderful creatures come to my garden, it just makes my day, it's lovely. Um, of course. Susan, do you know what those butterflies are in those pictures? I do not know what these butterflies are in these <laughs> pictures, which does not lessen my enjoyment, but <laughs> what are those butterflies in these pictures? Um, if, if people want to post uh, what they think they are in the chat, that would be nice. If you want to ID some of the things in these pictures, that would be fun. Um, but uh, while you're doing that, you can still post in the chat. I will tell you on the lower right hand corner, that's an Eastern tiger swallowtail and it's caterpillars host on willow is one of their host plants. And we'll talk about host plants in a little bit. And just to the left of that is a spice bush swallowtail. And it is on, um, it looks like it might be on swamp milkweed. Um, so that's another, you know, host, that's a host plant for monarchs, even though the swallowtails and lots of other pollinators love the flowers. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm always wondering about the names of um, the butterflies and something like swallowtail just sounds so beautiful. I'm always like, oh, a swallowtail, lovely. So it <laughs> has the, you can see it has the little tails at the end. <laughs> 
Oh, that makes much. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> She's the expert. She's the expert when it comes to butter. Well, thank you so much. And later in this presentation, she Lisa is going to go deep on um, the kind of butterflies that you can attract to your rain garden and um, what plants you need to plant to attract them. So it's kind of this miracle thing where you plant native plants and butterflies come. It's lovely. Okay, so another problem, another reason why you might want to build a rain garden is to fix a problem. And some of those problems we might have, you might have top of mind because the winter was just here and you might have a place where your water is um, uh, going onto the sidewalk and creating an ice patch. And of course that's not great because you're liable for anyone injured on it. This is um, a house in my neighborhood and you can see that the water goes down the downspout and then it goes underground, it's in a pipe and it comes out right at where that blue um, arrow is. So that's where the pipe comes out. And the water, you know, every time there's a little bit of a thaw, the, the water goes into the, into the pipe and comes out on the sidewalk and creates that massive piece of ice. And it is not fun. They're out there like chiseling the ice from the sidewalk. That's no fun. Um, and I'm just waiting for them to ask my advice <laughs> at some point <laughs> because the answer is so simple. Um, right where that hedge is, they could have a the same hedge, but it could be a rain garden hedge and that water could be soaking into the ground and captured by those shrubs. And it would work perfectly and it means that they would not be out there chipping ice from their sidewalk um, so many times a year because that's that's no fun. And the no one would slip on it, that would be much better. So ice on the sidewalk is something you can, um, something you can fix. Also, just, you know, those annoying wet spots when you're trying to mow the lawn. Here is somewhere where you can see the tracks where the lawnmower was. That's where it's too wet. But um, I designed for them this rain garden and then they had it installed by a landscaper. And here it is doing what it's supposed to do, capturing all that water and letting it soak in instead of flowing onto the sidewalk. Why would we want to do, here's another reason, because we want to go fishing in the river. We want to go swimming. We want to go tubing. It's fun and we want that water to be clean. And we don't want it to be gross. Like, you know, algae, this is not nice. Phosphorus ca causes this. And any gardener knows that phosphorus is really useful in the garden, but you put it in the wrong place in the river and it causes problems. I often say that our report card is what the water quality is downstream of us. So look at Lake Erie. That's our report card, um, enough said. And it's not the big polluters anymore. Those, um, like industry has really been regulated out of being the largest polluter in uh, the Great Lakes. Now it's, it's us, it's non-point, it's called non-point source pollution, which means it's all of our roofs and our driveways and the streets and you know all that dirt that uh, is on the, the street and the sidewalk which we can really see in the winter time, you know, like all that grimy um, slush is what then once the snow melts, it gets left on the sidewalk. And it looks like this until the first time it rains. And then once it rains, all this stuff is washed into our rivers and into the Great Lakes. So that's why we need to do something about it. Oh, see, gross, nasty. And all this other nasty, gross stuff also gets washed into the Great Lakes. and a rain garden solves that. It captures that um, pollution and when it gets into the ground, actually it filters out those pollutants. So there's little microorganisms that are gonna eat that E. coli that comes from that dog. They're gonna break down those petrochemicals that come from oils um, from the car. Some things they can't break down like lead and things like that, that just stays in the soil. Um, but those other things really get broken down and they get filtered out of the water. So that we can do this. So we can go fishing and swimming and have fun. And rain gardens, lots of people are doing it. This is, this is one of the solutions to, because the problem comes from all over, the solution also has to come from all over. And when everyone builds rain gardens, then it um, takes a big chunk out of it. So you can see lots of people are building them now. This is Washtenaw County. And when you build yours, build a beautiful one because 
we want you, <laughs> then we want your neighbors to be envious of your rain garden. It is so beautiful so that lots of people will build one. All right, so what is sort of the general arc of how do you build it? What's the general feeling? So you start out, and a nice way to do this actually is to join the Master Rain Gardener Facebook group, and you'll see lots of other people and their construction process. Like they have posted their plans and their, you know, here's Bridget, how she started out digging and then kept on digging and, you know, what's the result were, what does the garden end up looking out like in the end? And it's really helpful to see how other people do it. For instance, this is Betsy Lindsay, who built her rain garden to capture the water from her garage. You can see it's a pretty small garage, pretty small rain garden. Like it wasn't a huge, huge project. It was, um, she did it with a shovel, lovely work. And then this is right after it was planted. Those little plants are very small in the fall. And then here's the next spring, it rained and the rain garden filled up with water. And she sent me this photo, she was a little bit worried. She's like, my rain garden's full of water, is that okay? And yes, yes, that's perfect. That's exactly what the rain garden is gonna, is supposed to do. So here you can see it's full of water. Just a couple of weeks later, the plants are so happy. They're so happy to have that water and they're doing their job. So when you build your rain garden, your garden will also be in the Rain Gardener Hall of Fame. Okay, so the design assistance program that I talked a little bit about that both Lisa and I will give you one on one um, advice on your particular yard and your particular issues that you're trying to address. You might have other goals too, like um, you need part of the yard for your kids to play soccer on, or you would like to not look at some views that are not great of your neighbor's air conditioner unit or you know things like that that you're like other things actually are also important um so we'll help you come up with a plan for where to put your rain garden or rain garden that will not only be a beautiful rain garden but will also address all sorts of other design issues that you might want to solve in your yard so it's basically a personalized consultation uh, also, another way you can do it is to take the online Master Rain Gardener class. And you can do it at your own pace. It's on demand these days. And as you have questions, you can either post them in the Master Rain Gardener Facebook group where all sorts of other people who have also built their rain gardens can give you advice, hard won advice because they've done it themselves. Uh, but you'll also get some of the, like Lisa and I are on there, you know, giving advice as well. And um, the alumni are wonderful, though. They're really great and um, often have uh, better ways to do things. You know, there's no reason to do it the hard way. Might as well do it the easy way. All right. So um, now for our treat, uh, Lisa is going to talk a little bit about birds and butterflies and how to attract them to your rain garden. Oh, Lisa, you're still muted. Just got the notification. Okay, so not only do we love great rain gardens, the butterflies, bees, and birds also love rain gardens because a lot of the plants, especially if you're focused on native non-cultivar plants, are really are beneficial for our, our native species here. Um, so then a few things if you want, if you are looking, if you want to sit on your porch like Susan and watch the butterflies, <laughs> whether you can name them or not, does not matter. You can still enjoy them is to make sure you kind of, so, you know, um, provide habitat for them all year. So um, now it's springtime, a lot of people are doing cleanup, but it is you, uh, important to think about the butterflies are in our, you know, they overwinter in all, all forms um, in all their life stages. So then um, a couple that are pictured here, if you can see my cursor, this looks like a stick and this, Little short stick is the uh, a spice bush swallowtail chrysalis. So a chrysalis is the pupa of the um, butterfly and they camouflage. So this is camouflage to look like a stick and you can't really see it on this photo, but it um, even has like the coloration, like the lichen that's on the trees. You know, the little, um, um, little greens and blues of the, the material that grows on the trees. Um, in this bottom corner, this is the Pau Chic Skipperling, um, which is actually an endangered butterfly. And 
one of the few places it's remaining um, out of all the states in the US is in Oakland County. So that's kind of its holdout location. And they're, you know, the University of Minnesota is working on um, trying to, um, you know, uh, repopulate them. Um, and then there's a few in Canada, but the Powsheek Skippling, it overwinters as, in, as this uh, little chrysalis on a grass. So, um, so it's important to make sure you don't uh, clean up too good and then try to have some um, leaves and debris in your yard. Um, so besides providing habitat, it's uh, during um, all times of year, it's good for them to have shrubs and trees for cover. They wanna hide from their predators. So um, you'll get a little more if you have um, some cover for them rather than an open area. And then that gives them a place to hang out overnight. Um, you want to avoid disturbing their habitat too much because they are so invisible, so well camouflaged from their predators. Um, until it's about uh, 50 degrees for a couple of weeks, you know, I understandably you can't wait too long to garden, but you can do some minimal stuff. Just be aware that they're there and try not to get rid of them. Um, and then some of the more important things to do that you're going to be doing in your rain garden is to make sure you provide pollinator food. So they eat nectar and they eat the nectar and the pollen. So um, kind of your carbs and your protein. Um, different butterflies like different types of flowers. So then it's good to have diverse um, flower types, different shapes, different colors, and also to try to include some host plants. And I will talk a little bit more on the host plants because I know that might be a new concept for some people. Um, but basically, um, uh, the different butterflies have different um, plants that their caterpillars need to survive. But I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it, like I mentioned, aim for mostly native non-cultivar plants, um, just because that's what they've, they've um, been developed, that they've, they've developed with to see. So um, they, you know, are, they see different colors than us. Um, sometimes if we change the color of a, a plant, they might not be as recognizable to a bee or butterfly or bird. Um, and maybe changes in the flower, like, you know, when they cultivate something to have double flowers, then that nectar might become inaccessible to them. Um, so natives are really good, or at least native to the region. Um, and then of course, avoid pesticides and herbicides. Um, you know, a lot of times people might pro, you know, proactively add pesticides to their whole lawn. Um, and, you know, that is killing, it's, it'll kill the, the things that you don't want, but it also kills the things that you do want. So um, you would want to avoid doing that. You know, if, if you have a problem, then, you know, do what you need to do to address that problem, but try to avoid it. Try to find other ways of uh, addressing that issue. So moving on. Um, so nectar and pollen, we're pretty much familiar with this. Usually people just refer to the nectar, but here as it's just showing different flower types and we have a little bit of everybody here. So we have our Eastern tiger swallowtail on the um, swamp milkweed. Um, so then this has a lot of little flowers in there. It's very popular with the butterflies and the bees. And it's also a host plant for the monarch butterflies. So it has the double benefit of being a host plant. I'm sorry, a host plant for the monarch caterpillars. So many people are familiar with the monarch caterpillars as um, that the monarch caterpillars need milkweed to survive. Um, so then, so then there's, there's 11 different native milkweeds in Michigan. Um, you know, so any of those are great and a lot of, and they all have, you know, beautiful flowers that are great for nectar too. But um, beyond the, the, the monarchs, lots of different butterflies have different host plants that they, their caterpillars need to survive. So as I mentioned before, this Eastern tiger swallowtail, one of its host plants is willows. Um, this is a pow chic skipperling. So it has, um, um, you know, they're really, uh, I, I mentioned before that this is endangered. It's a uh, uh, holdout is in Oakland County and um, it hosts on uh, prairie, you know, it, it hosts on different things in even different areas. So place things where they, they think that it's hosted on in different states. Um, and, you know, like maybe it hosts on it here, maybe it doesn't. It's kind of hard to find information once the things become endangered. But uh, um, 
uh, sorry, prairie drop seed is one of the plants that, you know, it's suspected is that they believe it's a host plant for it and it has some other things. Um, and then one of its favorites, um, but, you know, getting back to the nectar and pollen part of it, uh, the, one of its favorite plants is um, black-eyed Susans. So the Rebecca species, the black-eyed Susans, it's, it's something that um, this little guy, this little guy that, you know, he, uh, it's about a, the size of a quarter um, or less. It's, you know, that's, that's the perfect size for him to sit on this black-eyed Susan. Whereas this Eastern ta uh, tiger swall swallowtail that's several inches, you know, um, wide, then that, you know, sometimes they prefer different types of flowers like this big one here. Um, so then we also have- Kipperling um, is so cute. <laughs> so, I I love, so one of my favorite things to do in the morning during the summer is I'll wake up early and I'll go and look for sleeping bees in my yard because because they're either hanging on so like with the little hooks around the back of a leaf or they're just like curled up into a flower and the first time I saw one I'm like oh no it's dead and then it just started crawling around like I disturbed it and then it just went back to sleep and it's the cutest thing ever um, so this is one of the plants. Oh, that's, that's the cutest that, thing ever. Okay. Yeah, it is the cutest thing ever. I recommend that because they're not early risers. Um, so, so uh, but this is an interesting plant. This is bottle gentian. And um, so then uh, the, it's, it, this is the flower. This is the complete flower. It's not going to open up and have these splayed petals like this. So it needs a bee that's strong enough to push it open and make its way inside there. Um, so then our native bumblebees are stronger and they're able to do that. So native, native, native bumblebees, I've bred them to be gentle, more gentle than, you know, whoever else has scared you in, in the past. Um, and I know from experience, I'm always kind of pushing past some flowers and then, you know, the bees might buzz at me, but I haven't been stung and, you know, I, I don't get stung. So they usually maybe put up a fuss, but then I don't get stung because I'm like pushing past flowers to try to take a picture of something and annoying them. But, you know, they're, you know, don't be afraid of your, your native bees. Um, there's a lot of good ones. A lot of them don't sting or even the ones that do, they don't, they're really hesitant to do so. They just want some delicious bottle gentian or some other flower to, um, to enjoy, to feed on. Um, and they're really our biggest pollinators because they actually take the pollen with them, whereas everybody else kind of goes to feed. Um, so moving on, here's our, you know, our hummingbird on the red cardinal flower. So the red cardinal flower um, is, you know, just a dramatic, dramatic red color that's striking to people. And it attract, it, even though it's a short-lived flower, it is, uh, a, it's just amazing to have in your yard and watch the hummingbirds visit it. All right, and moving on. Okay, so I already touched on this. So the host plants, the caterpillars of different um, butterflies have different host plants. And, um, you know, we can share a link on some resources of, um, you know, different things at different likes. There's really good books out there available. I don't know if you caught the uh, presentation with uh, Brenda Dizik. She's got a book, uh, Raisin Butterflies in the Garden that talks about the different um, host plants for a lot of the more popular butterflies. Um, but, you know, it, it, whatever you want to, you know, whatever um, degree you want to get into it, it's, it's very fun. But just to get you started, um, a, some of the plants that are great uh, for your rain garden um, and their host plants is, uh, one of my favorites is the golden Alexander. Um, this plant down here, and it's, it's a, uh, a host plant also for the black swallowtail caterpillar. Um, so even if you don't have golden Alexander in your yard, if you happen to have grown vegetables and herbs before and you have something in the parsley or carrot family and you've had some little round dots or some uh, little caterpillars on it, it very likely was a black swallowtail caterpillar because they also um, host on stuff in the parsley and, and carrot family. So. Um, if you want to eat the parsley yourself, I recommend you plant some uh, golden Alexander. Um, great rain garden plant, great early spring 
uh, nectar source, and you can relocate some of your black swallowtail caterpillars to that plant if you want to save some parsley for yourself. Um, so, and then also don't for moving on, don't forget about your, some of your grass species. Like I've mentioned the Pauchik skipperling before, um, prairie drop seed is one of its host plants as well as some other things. Um, so then the uh, Dakota skipper, it's another one that's, uh, and you know, um, you know, endangered and then prairie drop seed is its host plant. So then even if you're not gonna get those, those skippers and skipperlings, butterflies in your yard now, you know, if you got to think about if that seed gets taken off by a bird, then, you know, this, uh, this is something that's going to do good in the environment. Um, and it's just a beautiful plant. Um, okay, so then we have everybody's favorite, the monarch caterpillar. And this is on one of my favorite plants, the Sclepius tuberosa. Um, so this is a, a milkweed, uh, the Sclepius family, that's the milkweeds. And this is the monarch caterpillar that many people are familiar with. And it's a gorgeous orange. This one prefers more of a drier, drier. This one can tolerate you drier conditions. So it'll work well on like the, the um, for drier rain, rain gardens where they have a little bit drier spots or on the berm areas. Um, that's one of my favorite plants. And this is the spice bush swallowtail. And I will let you put in the chat if you can guess which, uh, what its host plant is. So. You know, feel free to do that. Let us know in the chat what you think its host plan is. Not seeing any answers yet. Okay, three, two, one. It's there. We go. Now I see them. <laughs> oh, I even got uh, the botanical names. Nice. Okay, so the spice bush swallowtail is a uh, host on the spice bush, and that is a wonderful rain garden plant. It does great in uh, shade or part shade. Right now it's in bloom. Um, and then it's a really good one. Um, so it's a really good one for early pollinators. This little guy is just such a cutie. So you see his little form right here and he has these big um, blotches and those are eye spots. So when he's tucked into a leaf and what they'll do is they'll seal up the leaf. So then, um, um, they're kind of hiding out in it and then they look like a little snake. So that's to keep the, you know, the predators away. They look like a little, they're just a little snake head. It's very cute. But if you still give it a hard time, what it'll do is it'll stick out the little ostrum. This is a not normally sticking out. This is if it's angry at you. And then this is supposed to have a little bit of a bad odor to scare you away. So this is typical of the swallowtail butterflies. So this black swallowtail, it would also do the same thing if you're irritating it. If it's on your parsley and you're trying to take pictures of him and he's getting annoyed with you, it will also um, scare you off with these little orange antenna and it's, little, it's supposed to be a stinky smell. Um, so moving on. Okay, so just to give you some uh, images of what those caterpillars are that we we're pointing out to you. So this is the black swallowtail um, butterfly uh, that you that this uh, black swallowtail caterpillar caterpillar will make its chrysalis and then it uh, emerge uh, in about 14 days and then it uh, look like one of these guys right here. Um, here's the Dakota skipper and this is just a little cutie. Like I love those skippers; they're just adorable. So there's this is this is you know not the most attractive caterpillar I would say. But, you know, the, you know, just the cutie little butterflies. Moving on. Okay, so then here's our friend, the spice bush swallowtail. And so here, here's the caterpillar, which we already talked about. And this is what he's going to look like later. It looks like I have some golden eggs, Andrew, in the background, though. But yeah, they're more, um, uh, yeah, so they'll host on the spice bush, spice bush. And if you buy a spice bush, it's good to get um, a couple of them. You know, you try to aim for a male and a female if you have room, um, just so you can get some fruits on your uh, female um, spice bush. And that's something that the birds would enjoy the fruits. Um, but it, regardless, you know, even if you can't fit that in your yard, it's great to just have them so you can have the, the flowers. Um, and then of course, we all know our monarch. Can I jump in? Can sure. I jump in? 
Um, for folks who don't know what a spice bush looks like, it is a great rain garden plant. It is beautiful. It's a shrub and it will get pretty big, but it's slow growing, so it won't cover your window too quickly. Um, but it's a beautiful plant, just glossy uh, green leaves. And it does, if you crush the leaves, it does smell spicy. It's a really cool plant and it's native, but it sort of feels tropical. It's a nice plant. Yes, it's a beautiful plant. I should have put more pictures of the, the plants, the host plants in here. Um, but I want to take all the way the, um, all the good talk about rain gardens. So first get well, you you're all about rain butterflies. Garden. I'm all about plants. So yeah. <laughs> so the monarch, we're very familiar with the monarch. Um, so there's the monarch caterpillar again. And this was a picture I took. And this is on the um, uh, New England aster, which is another great rain garden plant. Um, and so this New England aster blooms in the fall. And then so your, uh, your asters and your goldenrod are really important plants to include in your yard. So you can have, um, you know, I've mentioned some plants as early uh, nectar pollen sources. And then asters and goldenrods are really great for, um, so the bees and butterflies can either prepare for their, to overwinter whether they're going to do it in a chrysalis or, um, you know, if it's a bee, if they're going to do it underground or in soft wood um, or in a leaf stem and then, um, or if it's going to migrate like this monarch here. So, you know, getting ready for his migration, they need to stock up on fuel. And then these, so these, uh, the asters and goldenrods are uh, an important late fall nectar plants and great for rain gardens. Okay. So, just, uh, you know, many of the rain garden plants um, are already, you know, you if you already, if you have a rain garden or you're thinking about a rain garden, a lot of the plants that are on the list are already great for our um, bees, butterflies, and birds. So they're um, important um, as host plants. Um, they're important for nectar. You know, we have the purple cone flower, or we have the prairie dock, which is really gorgeous. It gets tall, but it's just these flower spikes that are really beautiful. And then um, also don't forget about the birds. So we will send you a link that has the, um, uh, that the Michigan Audubon has some uh, sample rain gardens. And then they also have samples of, uh, of um, different plants that are good for, to attract the birds. So if you leave these seed heads over winter, or if you do break them down, just break them down and leave them in your garden, um, you'll, get, you'll get the birds visiting all winter long. So it's wonderful. Um, even the, um, besides them coming for needing those seeds, uh, they also sometimes use the material, the stalks, the material. So I had swamp milkweed um, stalks, and this is a year before I was really as aware I kept seeing the goldfinches and the blue jays were heading over to my swamp milk, milkweed stalks. And it was in May. And I was thinking like, oh, I got to cut this stuff down or I got to neaten this up for the neighbors. Um, but then I kept seeing them visiting my, my stalks and they kind of move up and down the stalk. I'm like, what are they doing? So I'm watching them one time and videotaping this. And then they, um, I figured it out. So then what they're doing is they're scratching the stalk and they pull down this material and what it would do would cause like these little strings to come off of the stalk, these little stringy pieces. So I presume that they're using those in their nests. So that was very fun to kind of discover. So you'll, you'll discover all kinds of wonderful things. And I love to like hear about what you see in your rain gardens. And, you know, I think it's just amazing um, to learn about the life cycle. So that's all I'm going to say about the pollinators. We're going to learn more about the rain gardens from Susan right now. I love your um, childlike wonder that you brought. <laughs> I do too. You know, even though I don't know much about um, uh, butterflies, I do know a lot about plants and um, that uh, looking watching the plants and watching them change and then seeing them out in nature and sort of recognizing them like old friends. It's yeah. really it's a wonderful thing. All right. Um, you know, before I talk about opportunities for volunteering, there are some amazing questions in um, the 
question uh, area. And I thought I would address just a few of them uh, because they're pretty important. Um, Yi Ching was talking about how do you locate a garden so that you can capture the water before it gets to your icy sidewalk. And something that came up that's very, very important, and I'm glad she mentioned it, is you want the rain garden to be away from your house. So at least 10 feet and 15 feet is actually better um, away from your house because the water is soaking into the ground and you don't want that water to go towards your basement. You want it away from your basement. You are solving problems here, not creating them. So that is an important design criteria for a rain garden is it's never the foundation plantings next to your house. A rain garden is always farther away from your house so that you're solving those sorts of drainage issues. Um, also, Mary Pettit uh, asks, do, does a rain garden have to have a downspout leading to it to be a rain garden? Uh, what about a low wet area in the yard? And different people have different answers about this, but my answer is that yes, you already have a rain garden. It just has the wrong plants in it. You need to plant it with rain garden plants. So if you have a wet area that is annoying you for any reason, Put the, put the rain garden plants in it so that it's a beautiful yard, uh, garden and then you have a rain garden. The kind of like tweak to that is that if it's in an annoying place, if it's in an inconvenient location, you can always sculpt your land a little bit so that instead of having the wet spot right in the middle of your yard where you wanna have a barbecue, you can make that a little higher and then dig out a little bit uh, an area in it place that's more convenient, like maybe more in the back would be a better place for your rain garden. So you can kind of like manipulate where you want this rain garden to be. You don't have to be beholden to just wherever the wet spot happens to be. You can design it. So Susan, right there, you're saying you're kind of heading off that water before it gets to that wet spot. So then you can have your barbecue in that spot. You intercept it with a beautiful rain garden, and then you have your outflow go into someplace safe. Um, so. mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, you want the outflow of the, so the rain garden soaks in the water, but sometimes we have big rains, like four inch gully washer rains, and you want the outflow of the rain garden to go somewhere safe, like not to your basement, not to your neighbor's basement, all these sorts of things. And these are the sorts of like detail that are very important that we go over in the Master Rain Gardener class, or we will make sure to take into consideration when we're giving you advice if we do a rain garden visit. So keep that in mind. So those are two of the maybe most um, the questions that rose to the top, but there's some more that we can address a little bit later. Okay, so Washtenaw County actually has ways that you can volunteer in rain gardens. And it's another way that you can earn your master rain gardener certification uh, in case you don't have a spot to build your own rain garden or you just don't want to or you can't get the other people in your family to agree to it, or you live in an apartment, or you know, there's lots of reasons why you can't build a rain garden, but you can volunteer and earn your rain gardener certification that way, because really we would love for you to be a rain garden ambassador and you don't have to, if, even if you live in an apartment, you can do that. So some of the ways that you can uh, um, volunteer these days in a safe way is to be a volunteer steward in a public rain garden. This is the this is before COVID, so these are, people are not wearing masks. But um, you can volunteer to take care of some of the street side rain gardens. They're highly visible. They welcome guests to our community, and so when they look great, they promote rain gardens and they also are part of our civic pride. So doing doing this work is really important. Here's another area where we have rain gardens is along Madison um, Avenue. And here, they're pretty well established, so they look, they're still looking really good. It's wonderful when you volunteer and the garden already looks decent and all you have to do is keep up with the weeds instead of, you don't wanna start out with like a crazy weed, <laughs> weedy garden. Um, but you can contact us and we'd love to connect you with uh, a rain garden that is suitable for you. You know, the right size, we don't wanna overwhelm you. Um, just the right amount of challenge. There's also a new rain garden on Harris Avenue, which we would love to have an adopter for. So, but there's all sorts of opportunities. Um, in the past, people have put their rain garden in some of the local garden tours, like the Women's National Farm and Garden Association has a 
uh, a, just a garden tour. And one of the gardens built by David Baker, he um, was put his garden on that tour. And the rain garden is behind those two chairs. The other photos are how the water gets there. And he turned it into this beautiful, you know, creative interpretation of water and how it flows and under a rocky bridge and, you know, all this gorgeousness. So it's, there's another opportunity for um, being a rain garden ambassador. Also some people, uh, instead of building at their house, maybe they have an, a relationship with a civic organization that they'd like to volunteer for. This, if you're near the Celine Public Library, there's a rain garden there on the north entrance, near the north entrance that was built by two master rain gardeners. And they, <laughs> they hired the Celine High School crew team to actually dig it. This is another good example of getting teenagers to dig those rain gardens. And um, <laughs> the, Dan is actually like ex-military, so he knew how to tell them what to do. Um, and then Helen picked the plants. So it was a lovely combination of skills and it's looking gorgeous now because actually a different master rain gardener is now taking care of it. So uh, Maria, who's, which <laughs> two things. One, it means that the garden looks great. Number two, it means that poor Dan and Helen didn't have to take care of this garden for the rest of their lives. Like, you know, it's okay to retire as a, as a volunteer. <laughs> you don't have to do it for the rest of your life. Um, also, you know, maybe you have another organization that you have a relationship with a church or a school these are great places to put a rain garden. And in conclusion, this is fun work. It's gardening, it's what gives us pleasure in life, uh, but it's also meaningful work. This is good work that we can do because it's addressing like a really big problem that we all care about. This is how important and how weighty your contribution is. This is a photo of the Grand River emptying into Lake Michigan. And that's really what it looks like. So every time you build a rain garden, you're help, helping this problem. You're contributing to the solution. Because this is what we want our Great Lakes to look like. We, they're here for all of us to enjoy. Okay, so one um, in the chat, actually, Lisa, do you mind putting the pollinator um, links in the chat because I wasn't able to do it while I was sharing my screen. I couldn't do all of that at the same time. Um, but also some of the other links like the Master Rain Gardener class and the Rain Garden Assistance visits are um, will be coming to you in the chat. And then also if you need to go, um, there's that will you'll get a follow-up email with all of these links as well. All right, so some of the other questions that people had and feel free to um, type in more are, um, okay, so Charles Carpenter asked about, what about a partly shaded area versus a sunny area? Are both of those okay for rain gardens? Lisa very nicely put in a link to what plants, what rain garden plants go with what kind of area, if it's sunny or shady. Um, but the short answer is yes, you can put a rain garden, rain garden in a shady area or in a sunny area or in a part shade, part sun. They all work fine. Another question that came up was, oh, will the presentation slides be available to us? Yes, this will be recorded and we will share it with you. But Elena, if you're interested in um, giving a presentation about rain gardens in your community, I would love to share the slides with you and anoint you as ambassador of rain gardens. Um, so that's always an option. And people who take the Master Rain Gardener class, you are empowered to do so as well. Uh, well Elizabeth has a question at the, at the very end about, um, she has uh, an edged landscape filled with rocks where most plants have drowned. Could a rock rain garden work? There is landscaping cloth too. It looks like you might have seen that. Okay, so you did answer that online. I don't know if you wanted to answer that on the webinar. That's a good point, uh, Lisa. Thank you. The it, um, often, if you have a garden that is too wet, well, number one, I would ask her, how deep does that water, um, how deep does it pool? And if it's more than say three or four inches, um, I would start adding compost so that it's a little more shallow. You can also make the garden a little bigger, and that spreads the water out so that it's more shallow. The reason is because 
plants really can only take so much depth of water. Um, um, and so you, and then you want to plant the plants that are adapted to that amount of wetness. Our list of rain garden plants are adapted to wet and dry and wet and dry and wet and dry, you know, that fluctuation that happens in a rain garden. If you have a, a garden that is wet more of the time, you want to pick those plants that are more adapted to the wetter side of things. So I bet it's plant selection, two things, plant selection, you want to pick plants that are adapted to the wet. And secondly, um, you want to make sure it's not too deep, three to four inches deep and not really any deeper than that. So if you don't you mind me add, yeah, if you don't mind me adding to that, um, she mm -hmm. also mentioned that there's landscape cloth. If it was uh, me, I would probably get rid of that landscape cloth because I think it'll always be in the way. Um, I don't, I think you, you know, the rocks might not be ideal to have too many in the way of your plants. But there are things that will um, do pretty good around those rocks. Um, like a columbine, it grows, you know, tends to grow on my rocks. If it can take that, tell, I don't, can't recall if it can tolerate that wet type of wetness. But if it was me, I'd probably um, take that landscape fabric out because it's going to break down and probably always be in your way and then kind of rework it as a rain garden since it's going to be a wet spot you know if it's naturally a wet spot i think landscape fabric is something that they sell to people who don't really know much about gardening and then the poor people are trapped with landscape fabric and it's awful it's so hard to remove and the weeds grow up through it anyway and the weeds grow on top of it it's just a horrible um so either just bite the bullet and like cut it up and rip it out um or do it gradually, bit by bit. <laughs> I mean, it's really one or the other. Yeah, landscape fabric is awful. It's a horrible, horrible stuff because it doesn't break down. Unlike mulch, which you can put down and it breaks down gradually. And every once in a while you add more, but it's nothing. It's not a big deal. Unlike yeah, and if you make it tight with a, like a nice ground cover, like a wild strawberry or barren strawberry then you know that will take up that space here you know something is going to grow there it's always going to grow there eventually so if it's just mulch or if they have landscape fabric you know you're always going to have to weed that but if you can get your plants tight in that space then I think that that would help it be a little more, more low maintenance yes and you know Jean Persley who's an attendee who's an amazing gardener um agrees landscape <laughs> Awful. It's just awful. And anyone who's had it is like, oh, I'll never do that again. Um, Jessica Fowl uh, asks, great I question. Oil. What do I need to add to help the absorption? This is a great question. Did you want to address it, Lisa? No, she's good. Okay. Um, compost is the short answer. And compost is broken down organic material. So you might have heard of people making it themselves with vegetables in their garden. You can also get it from municipalities or um, like Tuthill Farms will sell you compost. And it's um, that wonderful organic black material that makes soil rich. Sometimes in a, in a hardware store or something like that, you can find, um, oh gosh, what is it called? Um, uh, something you don't wanna buy. Uh, and the, the word is escaping me right at the moment. Um, peat. Don't buy that uh, because that is like harvested mined out of natural areas and so it's not a um, sustainable material. But compost is. It's just like organic, you know, sticks and leaves and all that kind of stuff that's broken down by uh, decomposers and turned into, you know, recycled by nature into lovely black soil. So compost is what you want to add to clay soil. It's also, strangely, what you want to add to sandy soil to make it richer. So what I've seen in the past is that clay soils that you'll dig your infiltration test is this is part of the process as you dig a hole and fill it up with water and see how fast that water soaks in before you build your rain garden. So this is like homework before you build your rain garden. And those, if it's a really long time before the water soaks in like days, then um, compost is what helps your soil immediately get better the next step is to plant plants so that you get that long term, it'll soak in better and better and better over time. So first compost, second plants. 
Yeah, and you can look for plants that are great for clay. You know, like there's a lot of native plants that are really good for clay, and then you know they'll they'll find their their roots will find their way. They're pretty hardy. Um, and so talking about con compost, it looks like uh, if you wanted to look at the chat, there's a couple comments from from um, Nancy and from Jean about places to get compost. So thank you, thanks both of you. That's very helpful. And then one more thing I wanted to mention. Um, as far as like when you see the pictures of the um, rain gardens that seem like they're closer to the house, sometimes the rain garden is not started yet. You know, that might just be kind of like a bioswale where it's just planted and the water is just moving through. It's not staying in that spot. So the rain garden isn't actually starting until it's 15, you know, 15 feet or at least 10 feet from the house. Um, so your rain garden will blend right. It can blend right into your other gardens. Yes. Um, all right. I think we only have two more minutes before we have been an hour, and I think that's plenty. Um, but is there any other uh, questions that we should answer or should we end? Um, I shared those links in the chat, and we'll also yeah. send them out in the email. Yeah, I think we've answered all the questions. Thank you all so much for attending. It is wonderful to see so many people interested in rain gardens. Happy spring. This is the moment to think about it and I'm so excited that you are. Um, feel free to um, send us emails uh, asking questions about rain gardens and where you can put it. And if you need help, we even have like a fancy way to make an appointment with us that's easy to schedule. So we'd love to hear about your projects. And uh, actually, once you build your rain garden, I would I want to hear about it send me photos, send me announcements. I am so proud of you for building a rain garden and I wanna see it. So <laughs> uh, we even have a map of all the rain gardens in the county and we want to add yours to that map. So thank you all so much for attending today. It was a joy to see you and uh, have a good day. Thank you so much.